Ray from Prosoma here. We've all heard how interesting with G4A earlier, um, and we're going to be talking later about digital therapeutics. And it's a great opportunity here to speak to Andre, co-founder of Prosoma, which is a digital scale-up um, therapeutics company focused on oncology. So welcome, Andre. And it's great to have you here uh, live from Liverpool. So to set some context, Andre, could you tell us a bit about your, your background and, and Prosoma, how you came about in your involvement? Yes, so first of all, hello everyone. Hello, Tony. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm always excited when I can speak to you. Uh, so Prosoma is a medical company that focuses on oncolo oncology and creating digital therapeutics for oncology. So my personal background, I'm a medical doctor that uh, after completing my studies and starting the work, I did a typical thing for a medical doctor, which is starting own software house company. And then I moved into the, developing my own digital products. And for the last 10 years, I've been working with technology and I've covered a lot of, uh, I've always done ventures on the verge of uh, science and new technologies and implementing them for, for other industries. Um, and about three or four years ago, uh, we met with my co-founder, Marek, and we discussed the project that would uh, combine our paths together. Marek, uh, Marek being a psychotherapist that created the biggest LED technology company in Poland, me as medical doctor creating the software houses and uh, and technology companies, and we decided to do something uh, that will actually uh, combine our medical and technology backgrounds. And we decided to go with uh, we decided to go with oncology for multiple reasons. So, first of all, we decided to go with uh, digital therapeutics as a new thing in the world. So. DTXs or digital therapeutics come into play wherever healthcare system cannot really provide. And despite millions and billions of dollars spent annually on, on oncology treatments, on drugs that we develop and therapies that we develop, we actually do very, no, we don't do too much to, to solve the psychological and behavioral needs of uh, cancer patients. And we have no doubts that uh, helping patients to cope better with the disease on the psychological and behavioral side has great benefits to the treatment, but the current system cannot really provide. So we don't have enough trained personnel. We don't have funds. We have geographical and financial barriers to, uh, to provide the help needed to every cancer patient. And this is actually the problem we wanted to solve. We wanted, uh, we believe that every cancer patient, whatever he, she or he is located, whatever his financial status, they should get the, uh, they should have uh, the biggest chances of succeeding uh, fighting the disease. And that's why uh, we create this digital therapeutic platform designed for oncology. And that's why our ambition is to become number one digital therapeutics company for oncology globally. No, thank you. And it's really always a pleasure to hear about doctors becoming technology entrepreneurs and then rooting back to, to look at uh, very serious therapeutical issues. And you are classified then uh, as a therapy because you, you do get involved with the patient's mental state and, and, and that obviously has an effect on side effects of, 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 of uh, you know, uh, drug therapies and drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, how are you classified as a therapy? How is how is that route going forward? So, first of all, when we look at digital therapeutics globally, there is a still discussion what we're going to call a therapy and what we're not going to call a therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we don't uh, while we are using uh, cognitive behavioral therapy methods for the psychological needs, we don't call it psychotherapy. But uh, we have one consensus. If the, uh, globally, if the company is uh, able to conclude uh, the sufficient uh, trials, medical trials, RCT, showing that they're uh, that they're helping, that they actually can support claims to move uh, certain 
uh, endpoints uh, that are agreed by the medical community, then we can say that the product is therapeutic. And we as Prosoma, uh, we target uh, affective disorders that are secondary to cancer treatments, uh, which is depression, stress, and anxiety. And we use uh, certain uh, scales uh, during our trials to prove that this, uh, uh, that our application actually uh, decreased the depression, anxiety, and stress related with the disease. And we also target quality of life scales like QLQC30, and to show that uh, to show that we significantly can significantly improve the quality of life of the patient, and this is this is uh, these both aspects are in our this is our first product that we're launching targeting the quality of life and depression stress and anxiety and for us these are crucial elements of patient related outcomes to uh, to the primary therapy and also uh, there is tons of science showing that this correlates with effects of general treatment and lowers the complications but if answering the the question per se we can be called therapy as a product that in a clinically evaluated way can help patients to cope with depression, anxiety, and stress and improve their quality of life. No, that's, that's great. It's, it certainly satisfies the, the, the Digital Therapeutics Alliance's um, sort of a, approval mechanism. And, I, and I, I know that you've made great strides with uh, Digger and FDA in Germany and the US and, and now moving into the, the UK as well. We're One trying. Thing, yeah, it's, it's good, but it's a very big part. But compliance regulation is one thing. You know, we know that this will show efficacy and will show outcomes. The other big things are distribution and 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 uh, you know commercial commercialization. And we know also that you know there's a huge economic impact of managing oncology, the patient impact, but also the economic thing. How do you calculate and measure economic benefit to healthcare systems? How does that and how does that vary? across geographies? How, how are you going about that? Because that's going to be very important for you when you work out your uh, your commercial angle. Yeah, and uh, you tackled a very important issue here. And uh, a few days, about a week ago, I spoke to Ed Cox, who's our friend, and our we're also working with him uh, together with Eversana on US market entry and US market strategy. And they probably talked to the most uh, digital therapeutics companies doing business in the US and globally. And he named the commercialization issues as the number one issues for every single DTX company and actually underlined that the issue is often that digital therapeutic companies treat themselves as drugs, almost like a drugs that if I'm going to create something that is going to help patients uh, in, uh, in a meaningful way that, that the healthcare system are going to uh, buy it. But the reality is that we see is that digital therapeutics, the, the medical applications are treated more like medical devices. So yes, of course, we need to provide uh, the clinical efficacy that we can help patients, but we can, but uh what the healthcare systems and providers are looking for is showing the economical value for the system and what we're working on and what we are also tackling our rcts and our research and uh what we're also studying here is uh in our in our scenario showing the reduced complications reduced expensive complications of not introducing behavioral and uh, psychological support for cancer patients and we know that major de depressive disorder or generalized, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, which can come as a complication up to 20% of cancer patients, is going to cost anywhere from 10 to 20K dollars to treat for the system. So if you can prevent this to happen, that's, uh, and that's the gain for the system. And we also have a lot of studies showing that uh, patients' quality of life and mental state correlates with uh, days that patients need to be hospitalized and uh, general effects of treatments, which is also which are the numbers that we can calculate and uh, and hopefully show the healthcare system the, the economical value. But I if I think this is super important for every digital 
therapeutic company to work out the way to prove that this is actually not only gains for the patients, but also for the system in general. No, thank you, Andrew. And with Ed Cox, you certainly got a very good advisor there with his work in Dithera and Alzheimer's, and he's one of the he's one of the real pioneers of digital therapeutics. And one thing that's interesting, you know, the healthcare system is important. That's one of the key players. And what I like about Presoma Tickle is you, you do go patient first. You focus always on, on the patient and the individual and their needs and work backwards from there. Um, the other key thing is obviously oncology and cancer care is a, a major pharmacotherapy category. Um, how do you see Prosoma in the future collaborating as an add-on um, with pharmaceutical companies and how would you go about that? Yes, yeah, so uh, hopefully we will collaborate. I can tell you that we've been approached by some big pharma companies and this is also part of our strategy. But talking with pharma companies, we see that right now the biggest challenges for them is how do they are going to approach the need of personalization of treatment, which is a must for pharma companies and oncology, and how they can provide more of a holistic care and uh, cover more of a patient's journey. And to do this, they need to create some kind of patient interface, the way to communicate with patient. And this is not easy. Because if you give a patient an application just to report side effects and, uh, you know, report symptoms and or just be a pure, you know, like the form based assistant to the therapy, it's not really engaging. And there was no success creating this kind of uh, uh, solution by pharma. And the theory here is that uh, cancer patients in general can have the application that is going to assist them throughout the journey. Uh, bringing uh, all of the support that we uh, that we provide, and then giving some giving patient a tool that helps her right here, right now, that they like using, that they enjoy using, that they see a positive effects, that they feel better, and then on top of this, adding the features that will be uh, interface uh, for other aspects of treatments like symptoms reporting or uh, side effects reporting. Uh, so we really believe that like we see huge interest from big pharma in this region and uh, we right now are working on designing these partnerships globally. That's great. I think it adds another a very good comp because even patient support systems in, in the pharmaceutical companies' budgets is very big, probably bigger than most DTX revenue. So it's uh, certainly rooms, uh, rooms to maneuver. One thing I've noticed in speaking to many DTX startups and scale-ups is, is how the same challenges come up again and again. So in your journey, you know, if there was somebody that could help you in the future, if you were going to go through this all again, and, in, and in, the, in the journey to go ahead, what are the key challenges you've had where things could be smoothed over and, and improved in terms of all this rep repetition of the same friction points? Hmm. Great question. So in my opinion, the biggest challenges come from the biggest opportunities here. So the opportunity that there comes a regulation that opens a completely new products category that is going to be reimbursed, and this is happening globally, happens once every few de decades, right? So, but the, the, the opportunity here is huge, opening way for potentially billions and billions of dollars of markets. But at the same time, this is new. And probably if we started five years ago, we would have started too early. And we've seen that the companies that started early, like if you look three years ago, and this is also from Ed Cox, which I need to praise here for his insight. If you look three years ago at the big 10 of DTXs, maybe two or three are alive right now. So, and only right now, there is actually the reimbursement happening. And we will be reimbursed by, you know, the first quarter next year will be actually a prescription app that doctors in Germany prescribe and the system pays for it. But is this, you know, this happening, uh, since, uh, uh, it just started happening, dig us, right? It just started happening in the UK and in the US. And this is all new. There are no clear paths. Uh, every company needs to trailblaze. 
uh, you need to be. Uh, and the biggest, the biggest, biggest issue, and I think that I'm going to repeat myself, but this is weird. This is what we totally focus on is you really, we are obsessed on the commercialization model and finding the commercial ways to introduce products on the market. This is our obsession number one. We, whether, whether, and this is a challenge because every market is different. When we look at Germany and their German way and their setup procedure to becoming DIGA, which is the word for digital therapeutics, it's really different than the FDA pathways that we work with uh, Eversana uh, and we work with regulations, how to go through FDAs, the payers, how do we create uh, traction there. And also, you know, the healthcare system in the UK with trust with municipalities and this is yet a different animal. And uh, I think that only those who are paranoid about their commercialization are going to survive. And this happens to the extent that, for example, uh, Omada gets so much obsessed with their commercial model, they even stopped being digital therapeutics, right? They're, the commercial model came first. So probably anyone or anything that can help on commercialization, giving, uh, you know, legitimizing this as a business that is actually going to earn money uh, is, uh, is the priority number one, two, and three. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, and I, I, th I think we um, you're, we're very we're very uh, uh, delighted because you're also part of another thing I'm involved with the Department of International Trade uh, on the Global Entrepreneur Program with Persoma, and obviously the UK is very important to you. And we were talking earlier with John Wilkes about market entry in the UK, the NHS, and these sort of things. So, would you talk just now about every market is different? Mm -hmm. What do you see? How different is say the UK approach with say Germany? And also a sort of supplementary question is just you say you're prescribed, you know, you still have to go through the physician and and um, and um, you know and and GP, shall we say, to prescribe you, and they should have no they should have no hesitation and trust to do that. So first thing, how is UK and Germany different in terms of commercialization pathway? And secondly, is is the clinician can the clinician be a barrier, and how do you overcome it? with trust so let me start from the end yes i think that uh, clinicians being a buyer here is the number one uh, uh red flags for companies uh, for investors investing in dtxs and for companies trying to figure out their commercialization model and first of all we think that we are pretty different than the other dtx companies like we are vertically focused on oncology per se versus companies that are focused very widely, for example, on mental health. We, we also tackle mental health challenges, but we are very vertically focused. So I really believe that because of the big, big barrier of uh, being prescribed by doctors, a lot of over the counter, let's call it the DTXs or DTXs for conditions like mental health or sexual uh, sexual issues and uh, disorders uh, or skin disorders or um, other maybe not my other more general groups. I think they're going to be more commercialized uh, with a more direct to consumer access, while where we are targeting oncology, where the user journey of each patient is more normalized. We can actually ourselves to go for models when we really focus on reimbursement and being prescribed by uh, doctors in the UK. In Germany, we can be prescribed by either by doctors or uh, and or therapists, which is uh, which is a new thing for Germany. <laughs> this is actually a very interesting pathway for us because uh, being prescribed by doctors and targeting doctors as uh, as our agents is overused pathway and all the pharma, big pharma just spends billions of dollars just to market directly for to doctors and um, the, the billions that we don't have yet. So we need to be smarter uh, about this. Uh, Regarding the differences between the UK and Germany, 
I, I think that the Germany did what Germans <laughs> do. I don't want to be, you know, <laughs> but this is this is how they approach most of the things. They just created a very clear pathway and the process and translated it to every language and told they're telling you exactly what you need to do to become uh, DTX. And there is very clear guideline that, that the companies can follow. While uh, in the US or in the in the UK, we, you, you still need to, uh, there are multiple ways of getting there and you need to figure out the best way for, for you. But I think that on every market, we wouldn't move without a strong strategic advisor here. And uh, every market that we enter, whether it be this Eversana in the US, Mars in, in Germany, uh, and uh, same in the UK, we, we don't imagine ourselves doing it. We don't imagine doing it by ourselves. There's way too much, way too much knowledge that is specific to, to the local markets. Really, and that, that uh, sort of reflects what we were talking earlier with John Wilkes. But uh, we're, we're out of time. We could speak much longer. Um, uh, thing is, there any final words from you, Andre? Because we got to we got to wrap up and move on to the next thing. But um, any, okay. Any so for anyone that you are personally there, like my co-founder and our co-founder Emma is uh, is uh, uh, at the conference in person. I invite you to talk to her if you. Uh, we are looking for partners in uh, in the UK in forms of hospitals, centers, municipalities, and so on. So, if you're interested in uh, oncology and in uh, enhancing your oncology treatments, uh, feel free to contact us at prosoma.com. And uh, last but not least, thank you again, Tony, for having me. I always enjoy our talks and hope to see you soon. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Andre. Take thank care. You. Bye, bye, then. Bye. My name is Harun and I'm a medical doctor in the Northwest and the CEO of ExmaDoc. Now, for those of you that don't know, eczema is a pretty naff condition. Every year, over 8.2 million patients in the UK will experience inflamed, red and dry skin every one in three days. And it's made even worse because we still haven't found out what's causing these flare-ups. And sadly, there's simply not enough dermatologists to go around, which leaves patients pretty helpless and treatment ineffective. And it shows because over... 86% of patients are still unhappy with their care and there's more than a 50% treatment failure rate. So what we essentially have is an ineffective solution to a growing problem with a tiny and dwindling supply. And how do we know all this? Because we are a team of doctors, but more importantly, eczema patients who are tackling this problem. Now at ExmaDoc, we are delivering a digital health app that uses patient reported data to predict and prevent flare-ups. We're delivering evidence-based management and ultimately we're aiming to empower patients by truly personalizing care. And we're on a mission to be the most empowering, customer-centric and end-to-end -end healthcare solution for individuals with eczema. But we couldn't have got this far without the NHS Clinical Entrepreneurship Program and there's a few reasons for that. Number one is a network because we're rubbing shoulders with a variety of healthcare professionals, all the way from starting their journey to having IPO'd. Number two is the unfair advantages and these are the pit stops which do a deep dive into various topics and also allowing us with the opportunity to hear experiences from other healthcare professionals which has proved immensely valuable. And finally and most importantly for me is a community because it can be a pretty lonely place being an entrepreneur, let alone innovating as an NHS healthcare professional. So please, if you're interested, check out the program website or feel free to drop me a message anytime. Okay, Tony's here. Tony, come on down.
So I'll take a seat. I'll let you run that thing. Thank you. I think it's starting Yes, please. Yeah. Jeffrey. <laughs> Good, okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this session. I just want to speak very, very briefly about some enormous challenges that we have in society and the opportunities for digital innovation to address these challenges. So um, once again, my name is Barry Schreier. I'm the founder and chief executive of Giant Health, and uh, very, very proud to introduce you to some colleagues and uh, collaborators who are gonna talk to you about a new DTX Impact Venture. I just wanted to say very, very briefly uh, a, a, a summary of the situation. There's that famous phrase in Chinese history, which is a greeting, and also it's allegedly a curse, which is, may you live in interesting times. And I think the interesting element of that is, in fact, 500 years, 5,000 years ago, that was a curse. But for us, we view that as an opportunity. Uh, we love the phrase from JFK, who said, most people look at things and say, why? We like to look at situations and to say, why not? So what we're about to launch is an exciting new opportunity in digital therapeutics that we're going to be talking about. And it's to address some enormous, exciting challenges and changes challenges in society, for example, relating to aging and the cost of the healthcare system required to deal with that. Challenges in the world of hospitals relating to the fact that, of course, over 100 years ago, hospitals were invented to deal with chronic conditions across society, which no longer exist or are no longer the biggest <coughs> challenges in healthcare. Challenges in the pharma industry, where, for example, we know that if you take a drug to deal with an ailment, that doesn't necessarily provide the cure. And challenges in society at large, like the fact that we have growing issues relating to obesity, which is actually a man-made challenge. The challenges in healthcare are very much in society of our own making, so what we need are digital innovations to help us unmake the problems of our own behavior, which is very exciting. It's an enormous opportunity, and I'm very, very proud to be involved in the launch of a new digital therapeutics initiative to uh, address these challenges. So thank you, everybody, and uh, very happy to introduce my uh, co-founder, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And it's my pleasure to introduce our new initiative, DTX Impact Ventures. And we all, as Barry said, we believe that digital therapeutics has a tremendous potential to address many of our key healthcare challenges in the future, both health outcomes, but also health economics. So over the next 30 minutes, I will focus on DTX, key trends and opportunities. I'll pass on to Shafi, who will explain more about the purposes and scope of DTX Impact Ventures. And finally, I'm very excited with our guest speaker, who you can see there, uh, and Ian, and he'll be speaking about the, our first DTX Innovation Challenge, which is extremely exciting for all of us. So during our um, exploration of designing what we're calling DTX Impact Ventures, we spoke to many digital therapeutics players, healthcare thought leaders, pharma corporations, and they've all been amazingly supportive and collaborative with us. It's just a very supportive environment. And in terms of the, the definition, this is the definition of, of, of DTX by the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. And I do need to mention the excellent work being done by the DTA in supporting the development of the sector. And they published 10 fundamental principles for DTX. And the first two are to prevent, manage, or treat a medical disorder or disease, and secondly, a medical intervention that is driven by software. And that's, these are two fundamental driving principles behind everything that we do. So this slide is looking at comparing DTX with traditional pharma, and we know traditional pharma has been going for many years, and, and DTX is quite recent. And the basis of both is always about you know, human health, the outcomes, validated clinical efficacy, but for me, the biggest difference is that DTX continuously iterates. It's based on fast uh, data feedback loops, and we're continuously iterating and adapting and, and evolving change. Whereas when drug companies are, are produced and approved, 
they will not change for 10 years plus. And that has quite a lot of difference <coughs> in the culture and approach and the way products are designed, which sometimes makes collaboration difficult, but I, we're here to make collaboration easier and better. So the other thing is looking at active ingredients. Within, what is the magic ingredient that makes actually a therapy active of pharma versus digital therapeutics? Well, for pharma, it's the molecular active agent that are absorbed into the bloodstream. And in this example, we have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are widely used as an antidepressant. Whereas in DTX, the magic ingredient is actually engagement. But we shouldn't underestimate what engagement actually is within DTX, because we can see through functional neuroimaging that psychotherapy such as CBT can increase serotonin transport density, for example, addressing atypical depression. So really, both drugs and DTX engagement can have a molecular change and chemical process in the brain. And used in combination, we believe very strongly they can be even more powerful. So there's been a lot, of, even I, I mentioned that DTX, uh, and we heard from Sophie Park as well with uh, G4A, a lot of interesting stuff about DTX. It's a new industry, but it's actually evolving very fast. And looking from, from left to right, we have Welldoc and Amada. In fact, Welldoc was one of the most, was probably the most original DTX, and they were just founded in 2005. But they're more than DTX. In fact, they've evolved from DTX, as you may have heard from uh, Andre speaking earlier with Prosoma, and they're much more extended care disease management. That includes sometimes elements of DTX. When you move into the center of that, you've got Pear and Valibria, which is part of the Gaia group in Germany, who are a digger um, uh, endorsed. They're more horizontal players. They have certain types of CBT or um, some sort of mental mechanisms and prescription reimbursement. And what they're doing is they're gradually moving horizontally into other therapies. Then moving horizontally, we believe there's more work to be done vertically. And most DTX up to date has been about digitizing proven, proven therapies, especially around CBT. And I think very much that much of the low hanging fruit has been taken. But there is really interesting stuff where companies like Achille are looking at validating completely new non-drug uh, science. So Achille has created a, a science which is the first and only prescription treatment delivered through video games, especially for children with ADD. And I think it actually may have a, a point to make when the end represents the challenge going forward. And Cognito is even more recent, it's very noteworthy. They're using neuroimaging and have found that using light um, and auditory pulses controlled by software, they can stimulate functional connectivity between areas of the brain and they've been looking at actually addressing Alzheimer's during that way. And they've been recently awarded FDA breakthrough de de device designation in the US. So, of course, every company, and I think that's what um, Andre finished off with uh, earlier on Prosoma, the, the commercialization strategy is so important. And it's been a, a rapid evolution of reimbursement, especially in di digital therapeutics. There's Digger in Germany. Um, there's the FDA in the USA and there's very, very rapid developments. UK and Belgium probably uh, very much at the head of the game in Europe. But in my opinion, the key gatekeepers, um, and I think Orca has mentioned this as well in, in, in talks in the past, is the GP and, and, and physician. And we need to be able to have uh, trust and confidence and support of, of, the, of the, the clinical interface, shall we say. And this is where I think DTX players can work collaboratively with pharma. Pharma spends hundreds of millions of billions working with the medical community. And as we saw earlier with Sophie Park, uh, with Bayer G4A, pharma has the, has the muscle to supercharge distribution if there's a complementary benefit for them. So this is another point. The FDA and other regulators have been active contributors. And in our opinion, the regulation and compliance is very much the start point. You know, we have to have obviously clinical efficacy for the intervention procedures for safety, information security, and risk management. But DTX companies still need to prove economic benefit to healthcare providers, especially very complex healthcare providers like the NHS, and to insurance payers and others. And obviously to also achieve, there's no point having engagement with one person, you have to have engagement with millions of people, and that's where distribution adoption is, is so important as well. So commercialization and rapid adoption are the key challenges going forward. So we're here today, there's been a few years and it's changing rapidly. What are the key things? Why now is it, is it important? Well, technology is, is critical. We've seen about regulators and payers. Technology is really moving forward with personalized medicine, 
new sensors, and as I mentioned earlier, advances in neuroimaging, and data, real-time data feedback, measuring side effects and progression, consumers and physicians, COVID has been, has been tragic, but it actually has changed attitudes towards remote care and, 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 uh, <coughs> and actually self-managed care more in one year probably than the last five. And cost and skills, we've seen with in, increased pressure with uh, chronic diseases, comorbidities, and of course the pandemic, we have a lot of pressure. We've got to look at more cost-effective models of providing care. So we've been working with many early stage companies, seed stage and above in DTX, and we've observed consistent challenges, which turned out to be actually the premise, uh, which Shafi will go on to as to what we're looking to do. And these have turned out to be quite repetitive problems. So for example, identifying and working with hospitals and onboarding medical specialists it's just very difficult. You know, so many DTX companies and digital health companies now approaching healthcare providers. Who do they select? How do they get on board? It's just too complex. Designing effective pilots and clinical trials and reducing delays. You know, there's no point having to wait so long for ethics and recruitment. These can be really compressed and, and made more simple. And really the compliance part is, is more complex than a typical startup is able to look at like implementing <coughs> quality management systems, information security, and risk management. And finally, probably the hardest thing as well is you've got all these component, different parts working together. How do you build this multifunctional team? You need mobile design, you need data science, you need regulation and compliance, content creation, making even video games, clinical trial design, and also commercialization and pharma cooperation. So really complicated for a typical startup to be able to get their, their teeth around. I think I like this, John mentioned earlier, you know, start from the patient and work backwards, and this is our North Star. Everything we do, our central focus is always the patient, the individual that will benefit from the intervention. And of course, if it's a child, as in the case of older Hay, it's the parents or the guardians, they have a key role to play. Secondly, we focus on the physician, specialists, and other caregivers in the healthcare system. And only then can we really understand how to work and cooperate with the early stage ventures and with our corporate partners and, and the pharmaceutical players. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, or you introduce, don't need to introduce Shafi Dua, he's been off the stage a hundred <laughs> times already, so I'll pass on to Shafi. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So this is really exciting for us. A giant, we've been around for a, a number of years, working with innovators, startups, uh, VCs, trying to bring that community together. And now we thought it's about time we did our own thing and use that community uh, and our networks and relationships uh, to launch our fund. So it's really going to be an amazing ride and journey for us. Uh, and Liverpool seems a great place to launch this because we've seen so many great speakers about how Liverpool are becoming an innovation hub. Uh, and I'm so impressed by the city and the kind of the energy and enthusiasm around that. So as um, Tony mentioned, it has to be about patience. We talk about technology, we talk about innovation. Ultimately, it's at the heart of this is the patient. How do we improve quality of care? So our agreement is going to be how do we uh, reduce the kind of um, the life years wasted with disability and illness? How do we improve that and improve quality of life? How do we also combine treatments? It's not just about one treatment. We have existing drug treatments that's been validated that's good. How do we add value uh, in conjunction? It's going to be synergistic. It's going to be additive. It's going to improve uh, the outcomes. And also not to have too much friction. Because you know friction is difficult in healthcare systems, a lot of barriers to adoption. How do we make that seamless for people who want to bring in an idea like Prosoma, who spoke earlier, looking at cancer kind of treatment for patients? So those are kind of our, uh, our reasons for running this DTX. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're going to do is just help co-design. Obviously, a lot of hospitals, a lot of healthcare systems have enormous challenges that they need solutions for. So how do we help them with that? We don't just throw technology. It's designing, okay, what are those challenges look like? Is it a patient with COPD? Is it a diabetic? What do they need to help support? Either the behavioral uh, problems or indeed taking up drugs or medicines or whatever. How do we add value to that? And so I, we see ourselves as an intersection between the kind of um, uh, the uh, early stage ventures, healthcare as a whole, and biopharma. Pharma obviously have a huge interest in using different kinds of modalities of treatment, as we've seen earlier with here. 
And that, what we've seen recently is accelerated cl clinical trials. There's a whole load of papers in the Lancet and the Nature on how we're changing the framework of clinical trials. We've seen vaccines come in within the short time period because of the need, necessity, for bringing patients quickly uh, and uh, testing out some new therapies. So we'll be looking at that and using latest ideas around clinical trials and adoption. So look, what's our team? I think we've got the right skill sets, and that's what we've been working hard on, to bring the right kind of partnerships around technology, who understand business, who are entrepreneurs, know right, and successful businesses like Barry, for example, advisors, mentors like Tony for the, for the UNDP, global people who really know and understand the challenge of how to succeed to bring those ideas to market. So this is a kind of what we're thinking of as our kind of gateway and our network of bringing that collaboration together. And the key word in all of this is, I, I'm sure I've explained to you in the whole uh, day today, is about collaboration. You can't do it on your own. Healthcare needs collaborators, needs industry partners. It needs hospitals, innovators like Ian, to bring it all together. And that's the key. How do we fuse that together to be really successful and to provide those solutions to those problems we're discussing? So we talk about standalone uh, kind of therapies, how we add value to that all on its own. We can do add uh, treatments together to improve the efficacy. Uh, but overall view, we think that we can improve not just the, the, um, the kind of the disease process, it's the physical mental health needs. One thing that's very obvious for last year is how bad mental health has affected all of us and how important it is to understand people's holistic approach to their care so that we can enable a better society. And ultimately what we want is to prevent illness. We want to be well. We want to maintain wellness and well-being, prevent these admissions to hospital, take away costs associated with that. So our vision is much more global a reducing cost and increasing impact overall. And this kind of example, what we think we can do. Of course, what this does is produce lots of data. Of course, it'd be crazy not to use data in a way that it's meant to be used. Very specific, uh, targeted, make more personalized medicine. So all things that we do will drive data analysis, as we've seen earlier with AI, deep machine learning. How do we use that data on a population scale, like a city of Liverpool, or indeed a region, or indeed maybe a country, or much further. So it's again using that information in a different way. Of course, pharma and biopharma have done amazing things, of course, but they also struggle in understanding how to navigate through the healthcare system, as we've seen earlier in our discussions about the NHS. So how do we help foster that relationship with them? How do we help them navigate through the quagmire of healthcare sometimes. How do we improve that, make it much more efficient so we can see real time within six months, 12 months, real change and looking at how we adopt change very quickly and translate those ideas into clinical practice. And Ian will tell you the difficulties around that, I'm sure, uh, but they've managed well at Order Hay of really bringing innovation to the heart of an organization. So obviously our areas of focus would be quite wide ranged. Um, we'll be looking at oncology, we'll be looking at all these systems, as you've seen, and looking at comorbidity. A lot of patients have more than one disease or illness, which we can help adopt and support. So it's looking at how we use these technologies to improve that, uh, the health of, of those patients. I mentioned earlier about the kind of long-term conditions, COPD, asthma, diabetes, many others. And did you know, 60% of all the resources of the NHS goes to paying for chronic diseases. It's a lot of money, a lot of things to impact. If we can solve some of those problems, we'll save money, and we'll be able to redistribute that money in different ways and perhaps access mental health better. So these are the kind of percentages we've seen of people with problems overlapping with chronic disease and long-term problems such as mental health. And it's a problem that needs solving. We know that. A lot of people are now figuring out how to manage this better. If look at the areas that we're thinking of, these are the kind of areas uh, that we've highlighted, what we think we can add value. Well, you know, it's about the clinical pilot study for early startups, um, looking at the regulatory compliance, looking at partnerships through hospitals and academic health science networks, for example, looking at corporate innovation partnerships with major companies, and looking at product and human fact design, as well as the other things you've seen in, this, in the scaling up to diet state science tech, talent acquisition and ongoing support. So we're going to be offering all of these ideas and saying that we can do much more than just saying, here's a startup and we'll encourage you to work. It's how you get involved in the whole process and journey of a startup. 
So that's kind of my bit around what we're going to do. But obviously, uh, one, of the, one of the most inspirational guys in, in healthcare in the UK uh, is Ian, there's no question. When I look around who's doing amazing things and which hospital is adopting change, all the hay are in a league of their own. Uh, and we're so pleased to have them as uh, support with us. Uh, and also Ian's passion and drive to innovate, not just here locally, but nationally, internationally. So we're so pleased he's joining us on this journey. Ian. Thank you very much. Aaron. You can see me with, um, in real life, I can go red for the kind of embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> Such a lovely introduction. Um, I think most people here actually uh, know me and know Alder Hay, but for the viewers at home, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about what Alder Hay is all about. Now, Alder Hay is a, a really, really special place. It's been looking after the children in Liverpool for well over 100 years, and it's a massive children's specialist hospital on the edge of Liverpool. Now, the thing that I really, really like about Alder Hay is that it does primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary level care. And what that actually means is that if you need complex cardiac surgery, you come to us. You know, if you need to have advanced tumor therapies, you come to us. But if you fall over and scrape your knee, then you come to us as well. We will do the full spectrum from you know, what would be regarded as trivial right up to the, the highest end of medicine. And I think that's why it gets such a nice place within Liverpool, because everyone has either been treated here or has a member of family who's been treated here or has, you know, has got some connection to the, to the place itself. Um, so when I was asked, can you give us a challenge? Can you give us a, an idea for digital therapeutics that we could lay it down? I thought I'd try and kind of keep it in keeping with the theme of Alder Hay. Um, and not necessarily just going for the big sexy diseases that have, you know, huge research budgets and high profile, you know, like cancer and cardiac surgery, but actually some of the simpler things. And I think, you know, and we had a, a really good chat in our team actually, you know, what would be the thing that you'd like to fix amongst the clinicians, amongst the researchers? And one thing that came out was, was constipation. And I know that sounds like, oh my goodness, that's a trivial thing, constipation, that's, you know, nothing, but it's, it's really, really serious. It's a big problem and it causes huge amounts of harm, both psychologically and physically. Um, I have, as a surgeon, had to pull stomas on a child they were so constipated because they were going into renal failure from the toxicity of it. Isn't that incredible? 30% of children will have a significant episode of constipation at some point in their life. That's a huge amount and it's really difficult to treat. Um, it fills clinics, it's a huge amount of impact on general paediatricians, paediatric surgeons. And it's simple things like people don't present early enough with it. They don't come into the, you know, they don't get treated for properly early enough. And as a result, it takes ages to get them out of it. The treatment regimes are really difficult to stick to. Can you imagine giving a child a medication every single day, which involves drinking half a litre of fluid or a litre of fluid um, every day for two years? Is a four-year-old going to go with that? Trying to track their symptom progression. Things change, whether it's a warm day or a cold day. There's huge social and deprivation associated factors. There's changing their behavior around food and what they eat. Um, so I think it's an absolute sitter for, for a digital therapeutic intervention. And I'd like to kind of try and you know, build its profile because it's not something people talk about. Um, and I'd really like to see it fixed, as would most of the clinicians at Old Hay as well. So that's kind of our challenge there. We'll put it down. Um, and, you know, we're always willing to, to work with companies or people who have innovative solutions out there. And we've got a portal as well that we, we bring this stuff in through. So I'll, I'll hand you back. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. And what a, what a wonderful challenge it is. And there's no, there's no better time than... Well, behavioral change is difficult at, at best of times, but there's no better time than to, to try and instigate behavioral change than in childhood. And it's definitely one of the Public Health England's top priorities to have a best start in life. And it covers so many different things from, from dietary to sedentary to, um, to uh, just general awareness of, 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 of the sort of lifestyle factors that affect and environmental factors that affect and a lot of social impact as well in terms of the, the differences there. And obviously increasing levels of childhood obesity. So... We're really open now to, for collaborations and partnerships. Obviously, Older Hay is fantastic. We're looking for hostile trial partners. We're looking for DTEC ventures out there that have um, 
therapies in the areas that we're looking into. And of course, we really do believe in, in the collaboration with pharmaceutical companies <coughs> to come up with better, better standards of care, working with me <coughs> in partnerships. So I'd like to thank you all for, for listening and, and thank you also for to Ian and Shafi. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, so obviously that's, um, so I'm, I'm good, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you're, you're back on again, Ian. We can't get rid of you, right? <laughs> you can have to lose that spot, quite frankly. So you've seen um, uh, the hopefully you've been to outside uh, where all the um, uh, the exhibition is, and you've seen Alda Hay, I think, uh, Innovation Hub, showcasing all the things they've been doing over the course of time. The great 3D printed models. I remember seeing uh, Ian's team on the news about the opening doors of that plastic thing and also wearing 3D shields, whatever, right? So I saw all of those things and followed that wisely. So he's going to talk to us about how we...